All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Public Library Division. Um, first, like little known secrets of Washington State uh, info session. Today, we are thrilled to feature Riley from the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. Um, I am the chair for Public Library Division for this year, and uh, alongside me, I have Georgia, who will go ahead and introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Georgia Reitmeyer. I am the Vice Chair of the Public Library Division and we are really excited to have Riley here. Um, so I think we should uh, get started. And in case you have to step out or anything during the session, we are recording today um, and so this will be available on the WLA YouTube channel for future viewing. All right, take it away Riley. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I see some thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, my name is Riley Curran and I'm with the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library, or Wattable for short, um, because it's quite a mouthful. Um, and I am the new-ish uh, outreach librarian. I started last April, mid-pandemic. Um, and I think eventually my job will uh, entail a lot of traveling through the state, um, but right now it's been a lot of virtual presentations and then uh, doing um, visits to retirement communities that are, are, are okay with me visiting in person. So um, I'm excited for things to become more and more um, opened up hopefully, and I can kind of start actually getting out there because um, I am the one outreach person for this library and the whole state is really big. So I'm excited. Um, so my presentation today, I, my, my hope is that um, I can uh, show you how you can connect your eligible patrons to additional accessible library materials and how we would toggle and any public library can work in partnership to serve your library patrons. So that's my goal for the presentation here. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so just brief overview, I'm gonna do a kind of an intro to what our library is, um, who is eligible for our service, uh, how you sign up, and then how can um, public libraries and Watable work together? So that's kind of our, our gist for today. Okay, so what is Watable? Well, essentially, we're the only library in Washington state that's dedicated specifically to providing library services to residents who cannot read or have difficulty reading um, conventional printed material due to blindness or reading or a physical disability. That's our, that's our, our, our thing. Riley, um, should, your should your screen be up right now? Do you have the PowerPoint on? Do you not see it? No. Oh, so you guys. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll start it again. Sorry, sorry. I forgot that I stopped sharing my screen. I'm so sorry. Okay, can uh, you see something now? Yes. Okay, so this was up and I talked about it and then <laughs> um, there's another little screen of what we were going to talk about. And then I talked about the definition of what what Tobble is. Um, I'm so sorry I didn't have the screens up. Um, here I was thinking they were there. And then um, this is the next slide, so I'll start here. Um, so we are both a national and a state program. So we are a regional library of the National Library Service, which is a part of the Library of Congress. And we are actually under the Secretary of State's office as a part of the Washington State Library. Um, so I want to give a little tiny history overview about the National Library Service. Um, it was started in 1931. Um, it was called the, it's called the Pratt Smoot Act, or an act to provide books for the adult blind. Um, it was signed into law by President Hoover. And so essentially, it authorized the Library of Congress to arrange a national program that would provide books to blind adults. Now, this is around the time after um, World War I, when a lot of people were coming back and a lot of um, soldiers were experiencing vision or blindness. Um, so the National Library Service was created 
And um, the idea behind it was that it was really created to decrease the difficulty and high costs for other individual libraries to acquire books in special formats. So acknowledging that's very hard for individual libraries to do. So creating a national library service that would actually provide that. Okay, so um, we were part of the first regional libraries. There was 19 that got started. Um, but then um, as of today, we have 55 regional libraries, um, 26 sub-regional libraries, and 16 outreach and advisory centers. Um, so we serve all 50 states, um, including the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin US Virgin Islands, and Guam. So we are everywhere. <laughs> um, so now let's shift to who is actually eligible for our service. Okay, so the main definition we use is anyone unable to read or use regular print materials as a result of a temporary or permanent visual or physical limitation. Uh, so this could include, of course, blindness or deaf blind. It also could include low vision. And that we, we call our definition for that is anyone unable to read standard printed materials without special aids or devices other than regular classes. Um, so examples of that could be macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma, maybe a recent eye surgery, any of those things would qualify. The next thing we have is physical limitations, and that is the inability to turn pages or comfortably hold a book for an extended amount of time due to physical limitations. So examples of that, of course, could be arthritis, stroke, Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, um, any kind of temporary disability due to injury or illness or surgery, any of those would qualify. And our last one is reading disability. So that is the inability to read standard printed materials due to perceptual difficulties. Um, that of course includes dyslexia, but it might be someone who experienced a traumatic brain injury has lost the ability to read. Um, those would qualify as part of our program. Um, I really like to break these apart to really demonstrate to everyone the wide range of people who actually qualify for a service. I think there is a misconception, which is understandable, that we only serve people who are blind. And so I really like to pull these apart to make sure I hit home that it's not just people who are blind, but anyone unable to read standard printed material for any reason. Okay, so how do you sign up? Signing up is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. We have an application that's available online. It's a fillable PDF um, and it has an electronic signature option. Um, includes, we asked for the things like the uh, patron's contact information and reading preferences. Um, and it can be submitted via mail, email, fax. Um, and usually when we, once we get the application, the patron can start the next day. So we're a really quick turnaround. Um, and for folks who might not have a permanent address, so anyone unhoused, um, an address could be anywhere. So it could be maybe the local library, an organization, a friend's house. It doesn't have to be a permanent address. We just need an address to send the, the materials to. Um, another part of our application is our certification process. Um, it used to be a little bit more, um, it used to be harder for people to get certified. It was usually just for doctors or eye doctors that were allowed to sign off. Um, happily, that has been expanded um, to include librarians and library managers, uh, educators, certified reading specialists, um, psychologists, nurses, social workers, any other professional staff in hospitals, institutions, or public or social welfare agencies. So it's really expanded. And so we have a lot of different options with the hope that we are, are taking down some barriers for people to get access to our, our services. So how does our service work? Okay, so we have two types of service. Um, we have a mail service and an online service. So today, um, first I'm gonna start with our mail service. And um, by the way, all our services are free. 
And so there's there's no payments, no late fees, none of that is gonna be a part of our, our actual process. And our patrons can choose to use either one of the different modes of service or they can use both. So we have flexibility for folks. So um, for our mail service, we provide audiobooks and braille by mail. Um, we are able to use a postal subsidy called Free Matter for the Blind, um, which allows us to send um, things through the mail with no postage and allows our patrons to send things back in the mail without needing postage. Um, and in the images here on the image on the left is an older woman who is using our talking book player. Um, and then on the right is a gentleman reading one of our braille books. So for audiobooks, um, we loan talking book players, which is the black kind of rectangular shaped thing on the left, and cartridges. So what do I mean when I say talking books? Um, how are they different from audiobooks? Well, essentially, they're the same. It's just a different format is, is used. Um, our audiobooks are produced in a special format and put on cartridges and can only be played on a talking book machine. Um, so this ensures that only people who qualify for our services can access our books. Um, our talking book players are created specifically for our patrons and include a lot of accessibility features. Um, the player is super sturdy and um, you can actually, the patron can actually touch the button and the button will tell you what it does. Um, we have different shapes of buttons, some have color um, and uh, allows people to hopefully, if they're using the player, forget, oh, which button is the fast word button, they can use the um, built in user guide to then navigate that way. Um, and it, our players can also be programmed for Spanish. Um, and we have accessible accessories, excuse me, available for free, including a remote control for the player, um, headphones, uh, USB adapters, a breath switch. We also have um, an option to sign up people for a high volume player. So if someone's really hard of hearing, that could be an option. And our cartridges, so you see the blue case on the right, uh, there is a white cartridge there, and um, the default for our cartridges is to hold seven books at a time. Um, and we check out two cartridges per patron. Now that's just the default, so that could be totally changed based on the per person's preferences. I have people who have one book on a cartridge and want to get one cartridge at a time. I have patrons who get 25 books on a cartridge and want 10 at a time. Um, it's very customizable. We try to really kind of meet that patron where they're at and to make sure we're providing the service that works best for them. And um, our audiobooks are produced by the National Library Service and other regional libraries, including our own, or they're acquired from commercial book publishers. Um, we get about 3,000 new titles of audiobooks a year. And our collection is similar to public libraries or more genre focused. So we don't necessarily have textbooks or technical materials. Okay, so for our mail service, we use what we call duplication on demand. Um, it's a profile service, which allows us to customize preference lists for our patrons. So that includes um, finding out and their favorite authors or series they're interested in, subjects or exclusions. Maybe they, they don't want books that are very violent. We can make an exclusion for that. And our system will automatically pull titles from our catalog based on those preferences. And so the, we, what we call the service queue is then automatically reloaded. So every time um, a cartridge goes out, the patron will listen to it, send it back to us, and we will automatically create a new cartridge to send out seven new books. Um, the idea is we're hoping that it really limits the time between when people are receiving books and for book, people who are interested in um, selecting their own, that's also an option too. So you could do both. You could have, be a part of our auto select uh, service, but also call in books that you're interested in reading, and we just add those to the queue. Um, there also is the option if you don't want any any manual uh, any automatic 
picking, there's option for strictly request only. And so that allows people to um, only receive books that they request. <laughs> and uh, essentially that means that uh, it's up to the patron to make sure there's always books that are kind of in the queue. We don't automatically send out a cartridge if there's no books in the queue. Um, so it really comes down to kind of the preferences of the patron and what makes the most sense for them. I would say, I think about like 85% of our users use our nightly auto select duplication on demand service. Um, and what's interesting about our service is that we actually have a, a copyright exemption, um, which allows us to reproduce books without being subject to copyright restrictions. So for example, if the new, one of the new popular books come out and we have access to it, um, instead of having maybe three copies um, and then having to put people on hold, we can download as many as we want. Um, so that makes it a really kind of nice service. So there's really no waiting period for specific titles um, and, of course, no late fees or um, uh, anything like that. Um, so uh, on the screen right here is just a little screenshot of what a patron's preference list looks like. Um, you'll see that they have series in there that they like. Um, they have a few that a series they don't like, um, as well as subjects and authors. Um, so for our Braille books, it's the same exact system and setup. Um, we have about 40,000 Braille titles uh, and a little over 15,000 e-Braille titles, which are continuing to, to grow. Um, we average about 500 new Braille books a year. Um, and we're really excited. We just started a new uh, pilot program, which is now no longer a pilot, but happening. Um, and we are able to provide Braille e-readers for our patrons. So anyone who's a Braille reader can request to use a Braille e-reader, which is on the right-hand side here. And it's a refreshable display. So instead of um, carrying volumes of Braille books around, this is kind of a more mobile way of using um, kind of a about for reading essentially so as you go through the pages you hit a button and the characters um, will actually pop up into different ways and so it's really kind of amazing to have um, that option and to provide that for our patrons and with our e-readers e patrons can actually download all um, their brave files and add them to like an sd card or they can be put on cartridges and it's very kind of kind of up to the patron. Okay, so our online option, um, it provides our patrons with an account to the National Library Service download and uh, download and mobile app option. We call it BARD or Braille and Audio Reading Download. Um, it's a national uh, download site and um, has a mobile app. Um, we have over 120,000 audiobooks in the collection, and that's growing constantly, especially our foreign language collection. We're getting a lot more books that way. Um, again, we have electronic Braille, uh, and we have access to audio and Braille magazines. Um, we don't have music, like actual music available, but we do have musical scores. We have um, recorded instructional materials, so like how to, how to learn how to play the guitar. Um, and then materials kind of about music appreciation, like maybe about the musician or um, a type of music. And none of our, these books ever expire. So a patron could keep one book um, on their device forever. And it doesn't really matter to us. Um, the only reason they might take it off is because they run out of space. Um, so the, because of that copyright, um, we don't have that copyright restriction, we're able to provide that and have patrons have the book of their choice as long as they want. Riley, how long has the online service been available? That's a great question. I uh, believe it's, I should know this. That's a really good question. I'm, I'm assuming the last few years, I will have to get back to you on the exact date on that, but I know it's relatively new and, um, it's something that they're constantly trying to improve. So it's one of those things that just continues to get better and better. So, but I can find out the exact date for you. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yes. Um, 
So in addition to having just library services, we also have other programs and services. We have our own audiobook production. So we produce audiobooks in the library. We have our own recording booths and we have volunteers that go through an audition process. Um, we focus on producing books that are really um, Northwest focused. So that could be maybe the authors from the Northwest or the book takes place in the Northwest. Um, we try to make it really specific to the Northwest in general. And we average about 200 books per year. Um, and what's nice about this is that when we produce these books and we make them available to our patrons, we're not only making them available to our patrons, but to anyone in the National Library Service. So they automatically get sent up into BARD and anyone can access them. So we saw um, a kind of a need to really have Northwest focused books and to really highlight those. And that was kind of why we focused on that. We also have a Braille book production department. Um, we produce about 50 books a year. And similarly, we focus on Northwest titles, authors, um, and we have volunteers that do that, including um, rail transcription and uh, review. Um, and we've also actually in the past recently just finished up a Braille transcription class that we offer for free for folks interested in learning Braille and potentially being a volunteer. Um, and we do the voters pamphlet as well. And the class is excellent. I can confirm this. <laughs> um, how would a person become a volunteer to read? To read, we have, um, uh, I can connect you with our volunteer coordinator. Um, it is something that uh, I know with the pandemic, things kind of got a little bit narrow in terms of how much space we had, but um, it would just be a matter of reaching out to our volunteer coordinator and signing up. And um, I don't know their process for the audition. I'm not sure where they're at, but that would be the first step. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we also have a, a fantastic youth services program that provides in-person, online, and traveling programs. We have uh, early literacy, so we have a multi-sensory story time. Um, it used to be in person, but since the pandemic has gone um, online and on YouTube. And what's really cool about this is that our youth services librarian will actually send out kits to the different um, uh, children that are going to be using our server or watching the videos and actually be able to have the multi-sensory experience along with um, our librarian, Erin, who's doing the story time. Um, if people come to our library, we also have a children's playroom with a lot of different accessible things. And then for our teens, uh, there is an accessible escape room that we created, a teen advisory board, and accessible gaming lab. Um, and, and in the summer, uh, we do summer reading by mail. So we uh, it's a um, something where student or students, excuse me, youth, youth will sign up and be a part of the summer reading program. And then our librarian will send out weekly um, kind of kits for them to use based on a certain theme. And it goes throughout the summer as well as um, Aaron plans events throughout the state for the first uh, our, our pair teams to participate in. Um, we also have the annual Braille challenge, which is um, where we have youths, uh, I don't know, I'm sorry, I keep saying youths. We have our patrons who um, are given a challenge to do, um, to actually do Braille and it's a national thing. So it's every year, it's a, it's a new option for that, for our students. Um, and of course we have youth specific readers advisory service. Um, in addition to that, we have Readers advisory. So we have readers advisors who are available uh, from 8.30 to 5, um, Monday through Friday, and they can help with book suggestions and adding books to a person's um, request queue. We also have support for technology and instruction. So we have a new integrated services librarian who provides support with our players, with BARD app, with um, any kind of accessible technology that can be used with our service. And so he's a great resource for folks who might find kind of a, maybe there's something that's not working on in terms of the app, he can kind of walk you through that. 
And of course, we do outreach. We do statewide outreach. Um, we do tabling. Uh, give we give presentations at conferences, community events, and fairs. Um, and as I mentioned, we do have a really amazing volunteer program. We have about like 200 ish volunteers. And I think that we found that that was like the equivalent of having seven full time employees. So we really rely on volunteers to do, provide a lot of our service and they're integral into what we're able to do. Um, so including um, other volunteer jobs um, would be like a book reviewer, that'd be Braille or audio. Um, we have shipping support as well as special projects and other events. Okay, so how can public libraries and Watauvel work together? Well, you know your community. You have established relationships. You're uniquely qualified to assess the need of your patrons. Um, and you can actually help patrons sign up to access those services. So we see it really as a critical partner in, library, in providing library access to some of your patrons and community members. So how can you help? So you can help us by spreading the word about this free service. Um, you can maybe identify eligible patrons that might benefit from our services. Um, and as a reminder, librarians and library managers can certify patrons, so that makes it really easy. Um, you can help patrons fill out the application. Um, and once we get the application, they get serviced the next day, um, business day, I should say. And then also you can help patrons use um, the library computers to, or Wi-Fi to download um, from BARD to a flash drive or use the wireless for BARD mobile. So those are all the different things that can really, um, that you can do as a public library to support your patrons. Riley, we had a question in the chat too about if a person lists their public library as their main mailing address, if they are unhoused or prefer not to send materials home, would that be possible? How would that work? And how would Watauble get books to those patrons? Sure, yeah, it would totally it would totally be possible. So if they wanted to list their um, library, it would be something where we would um, use the library's uh, address as long as the library is okay with having that as something that they're willing to receive. And we would just say care of so-and-so public library and then put their name on it too. So it really doesn't have to be a permanent address. It could be somewhere, as long as that person has access to actually get those materials, get that mail, um, there's, no, there's no other restrictions in terms of that. Does, does that answer the question? I believe so. Yeah, okay. they said yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, great question, because that's something that people don't recognize or realize. Um, and in terms of how we can support you, we can support you with materials. We have tons of brochures, so we can send applications, bookmarks, any kind of other informational material. On the right-hand side here, you'll see some of the materials available that we can send out, no big deal. It's very easy for us. Um, and we have a lot of libraries right now who do request that are continually requesting them as they go through the materials. Um, we can also do presentations in person or online, similar to what we're doing right now. And it could be for library staff, but it also could be for patrons. So maybe you have, um, you're aware of a low vision uh, book club that could potentially be interested in this service. That's something that we could then set up a time to present either in person or online, depending on um, what's, what works best. Um, we can provide support via email or phone, and that's including technical support. So if maybe you're working with a patron and you're trying to download a book off bar, but for some reason it's not showing up, we can actually be that support for you and the patron. You can call us, you can email us, and we can kind of walk you through the steps. And then um, finally, as a library, we can actually set up libraries as institutional accounts. So we can provide libraries with a demo talking book player and cartridge as well as a demo BARD account. So both of those 
would allow librarians, library staff to say, hey, I know this service, let me show you their player, um, to have the ability to kind of see that hands on, um, we find is really helpful. And it also gives the opportunity for librarians and library staff to really understand how, how the service works and be a resource for their patrons. Should I go ahead and put your email in here or I see Tracy is on the call. Tracy, do you wanna put your contact info in here? I'm um, sure, happy to. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, so the main takeaway um, that I wanna just send out there is that as public libraries, you are most likely to notice when your patrons can no longer use the standard print collection. Um, so whether it is at an outreach event or a circulation desk, we hope you tell patrons that they can borrow an easy to use talking book player and all the books they want, that there's no charge to borrow or return books by mail and there are no overdue fees, and that they don't have to be blind, just have difficulty reading or holding a standard print book. So thank you so much. I have my email on here as well. And there's also a link here for our materials I can drop into the chat too. So if you are interested in requesting materials, um, that is easy enough. It's just a form that you can fill out and then I will mail things out to anyone interested. Um, so thank you again. I am always really excited for the opportunity to, um, to kind of talk about our service, but especially with public libraries, because I, I really do feel like you're like a integral part of our service, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, um, anything, yeah. Beatrice, go ahead. Hi, I'm out walking my dog, so it might be a little noisy outside, <laughs> but um, I've been listening. Thank you, this is very informative. Um, I'm trying to remember the questions that came up for me. Um, you say there are no late fees, that's great. Are yes. there replacement charges if they lose a cartridge or the, or the player or whatever, anything? Yeah, great question. There are, there are not. Um, we are of the understanding that things get lost, especially in the mail, that things happen, people using our equipment, things can get broken or messy. There's no um, uh, fines or um, fees related to that. We just send a patron a new uh, talking book player or send them new headphones and that's kind of just the understanding we have that, that things happen so okay that's great to know yeah um and then uh another question i had was you talked about you could put like multiple books on a cartridge yeah. so that means you're like downloading to a cartridge it's different or is it like i just want seven books and you just send them seven books or a cartridge that happens to have seven books yeah. I, I guess my question is, is it customizable? Sure, to, sure, yes. Know. It is totally customizable. So we have the option for patrons to have us auto select books for them. So those, um, those patrons would give us preferences that they like and types of books. And then our system automatically populates titles that then get sent out on cartridge. But we also have the option for our patrons to call in and say, hey, I want this new book and we'll add it to their next cartridge or they can say, hey, I only want books that we I, I actually request. And that is also an option. So then every time we get a cartridge back, as long as we have a list of books for them, that we will then send another cartridge out. So it comes, um, if you want to request your own books, that's an option. It just won't be automatic like the other option would be. Okay, okay. And then um, you mentioned the volunteering, which I think sounds like a great retirement gig. <laughs> um, um, Volunteering takes place in Olympia? No, good, good, good question. We are actually not located in Olympia. We're in Seattle. Oh, um, you're right. Yeah, so we're um, in South Lake Union area, um, kind of um, right in the thick of it. Um, and plug for anyone interested, we always love giving tours of the library or for people to visit. But yeah, so we are located in Seattle. Okay, and we, great. And we well, have free parking. We have free parking. Yes, free parking. <laughs> so add that to your list <laughs> <laughs> okay um i might just try an audition to record uh children's books so <laughs> i'll keep that in mind yeah. thank you uh, thank you
And I was talking to Tracy a few months ago and found out that it's not just limited to librarians who can help certify people for eligibility. We have library associates at Snow Isle that would be eligible um, and like branch managers, circulation supervisors. It's um, other professional staff of hospitals, institutions, public or social welfare agencies. So it's, it's more than just librarians, especially yeah. if you don't have any librarians at your branch. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's a really important thing to know because I think there's an expectation it has to be just librarians, but that's not the case at all. Hi, um, Georgia here. How would one arrange a tour? Do we need to email you or? Good question. So I'm going to drop uh, the link to the form in the chat box here, but there's actually so you can request materials, you can request a tour. Um, so it's kind of our main outreach form. Um, let me see if I can pull that up here. Thank you. I have the link up on my screen, Riley, if you want me to post it. Oh, yeah, that would be great. It's the um, outreach materials. Yep. yep. Awesome. Thank you. And then there's a question of how is the library funded? Good question. So we are funded um, both federally and through state funds, but we also have a um, we get a lot of donations, so we have a huge donation. We have our part of a the All Foundation, so we get resources through that. So it, it's really a mix of all three that um, that allow us to continue providing service. Do we have any other questions? I know we're getting close to a lot of people's opening times. Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat if you like. I had a question. I'm wondering how you do your outreach. Like, how do you reach people? Do you guys advertise besides at public libraries? Like, do you reach out to retirement homes or doctor's offices? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something that has always been something that we've struggled with. I think. Um, we've been around a long time and not a lot of people know about us. So the more opportunities we have like this to present to um, people who will work with potential patrons um, who could benefit from our services, a huge one. Um, recently, we did a huge mailing to ophthalmologists and optometrists in the state. Um, I do a lot of presentations and outreach to retirement communities and senior centers. Um, we're also looking into trying to get connected with um, associations, so like the Adult Family Homes Association, so that we can get people who are on staff to know about the service who can then sign up people that way. But it's it's a constant thing. It's something that we are, I think, really rely on word of mouth as well. So people who know about the service, who know someone who could benefit, passing that along. Um, but I think we are definitely trying to think of new ways to continue doing outreach, especially since it's statewide. It's, it's something that you know, as one, one person, it's really hard to be able to reach everyone. So, um, yeah, that's something we're always working on. Thank you. Yeah. And you're currently hiring for a receptionist and a registrar too, aren't you? In case anybody knows anyone looking for positions. Yeah, we are. We actually uh, just hired a receptionist, but we are still looking for a patron registrar. So if you are interested, feel free to email me and I can give you a little bit more information and the link to uh, apply. Excellent. Well, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and I'll turn on my camera too real quick. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. I hope that this was useful information. Um, I have found it to be incredibly invaluable and have been trying to share it with my system every chance that I get. Um, so if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Riley or Tracy. They are wonderful human beings. Um, if you have ideas for a future info session, whether you um, like we, a lot of libraries started offering Discover Passes or Seattle Public has their museum passes that they can check out. If you have a resource um, that you offer that you want more people to know about, that we can celebrate for you um, and that we can help spread the word about, um, whether it's other state organizations or you know anything, please get into contact with Georgia or myself and we would love to um, highlight that at one of our future meetings and, and see if we can turn this into a series. So with that, thank you everybody for joining us and we hope to talk to you all again soon. Thank you for arranging this.